Greetings and welcome to Life After Corona, a conversation between the elephant and concerned citizens on the past, present, and possible futures for this pandemic. Uh, today I'll be speaking to Gala Chome. Uh, Gala Chome is, uh, is an academic, historian, uh, and expert on security in the East African region. Karibu Gala. Asante sana, Joe. I mean, just just before we get started, uh, I just like to to ask to ask you how how you are adjusting. I think I think we are beyond the, the level of coping. How are you adjusting to to life life after Corona? Well, uh, it, it it's a bit different for me because uh, you know I'm I'm a, I'm a postgraduate student. I'm in my final year of uh, of working on my PhD. So I mean, my life for the last two years has has quite been been uh, been you know uh, uh, home home you know working working from home um, uh, not much leaving the house uh, writing so it's it's just that the intensity of it increased during during this period um, mm -hmm. um, but I think that for me personally um, I know there's a lot of talk around um, you know quarantine fatigue. But right. but I think I think for me personally I'm I'm getting back to a kind of rhythm, and and I'm I'm doing quite okay. But I'm, but I'm sure I'm sure this is not the case for for for, for many of those who have to go out to make a living. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean just just you know let's let's jump into it. I mean, I mean, I mean you've you've written quite a bit about the terrorism in East Africa, particularly in the coast. So just, I mean, I would just like for this, for the, for the sake of just starting the conversation, what are, what are some of your general observations, how, how you think uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID is going to change the landscape of terrorism uh, in East Africa? Well, I think it's, it's already changing. That's, that's actually the, the key observation that's being made um, um, in, in a kind of research circles that I'm in. Um, but I think before we kind of go into that, I think it's 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 important to to appreciate that even before the the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, uh, a number of interesting trends were already taking place in terms of how um, uh, Kenyan nationals were getting uh, radicalized and recruited into into extremist groups in the region, in particular Al Shabaab. Um, um, since around 2014, 2015. So two major uh, kind of uh, phases are important to pay attention to. Um, is that when Al-Shabaab emerged in, um, you know, first of which is when Al-Shabaab emerged in Somalia in 2006. Uh, uh, this is a bit historical now, but, but you know, Al-Shabaab is kind of emerges out of the ashes of the Ethiopian invasion of, of Somalia in 2006 that kicks out the the Islamic Courts Union in Mogadishu, um, and Al Shabaab quickly establishes itself in southern Somalia. Um, um, it is from that uh, moment where you see evidence of the first Kenyans uh, joining Al Shabaab um, um, uh, that early on, 2007, 2006. Um, maybe a year after that, 2007, 2008, there was already a well-established network of, uh, of recruitment and radicalization, especially spread around key Kenyan mosques from Mombasa, uh, Nairobi, and even further country, Nyeri and uh, towns like Eldoret, um, where key uh, uh, preachers or clerics um, um, would do a lot of work in, in, in taking charge of the mosque platform to declare their support for groups such as Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda, to castigate uh, what we would call moderate uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim clerics and, and, and Muslim politicians, uh, sort of like creating their own um, uh, space of debate uh, and discussion, um, uh, presenting their own views about what needs to be done in particular to address the Muslim condition in Kenya, which as we know is a Christian dominated country. So by 20, from 2007 to 2012, um, um, this network had grown, not only in terms of the, the number of mosques they had taken charge of, 
but also the number of people they were now able to recruit to join Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Um, so that by the time the Kenya government decides to send uh, the Kenya Defense Forces to Somalia to root out Al-Shabaab from its key bases there, um, the network was said to have recruited around five, between 500 and 1,000 Kenyan nationals uh, fighting within its ranks in, in, by 2011. Um, and of course, it was this kind of group of early recruits that were responsible for, for, for the first kind of spate of attacks we witnessed between late 2011 and throughout 2012. Um, and, but then it was also at the same time that we saw a, a, a very heavy handed response from the, from, from the security agencies in Kenya targeting this network. So a lot of the operational and, and ideological leaders were, were assassinated, <clears throat> excuse me, between you know, uh, 2011 to, 20, to about 2014. I think I, I always talk about the, 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 the assassination of, of, uh, of uh, Makaburi, of Baka Sharif, commonly known as mm -hmm. Makaburi, in 2014. Kind of the last um, uh, killing in this spate of killings, but it was also kind of, kind of symbolic uh, because then there will be a major change after that in terms of how radicalization and recruitment be, uh, happened in the country. So from 2015 uh, onwards, uh, a, number, a number of key changes were, were instituted within the network itself that had been influenced by how the state had responded to its activities since 2007. And one of these kind of change, uh, uh, a major one, is that a lot of the remaining operatives of this, connected to this network, um, uh, were dispersed from, from, from the traditional zones that they're taken charge of on the Kenyan coast and northeastern Kenya. They were dispersed from those regions and, uh, and uh, you know, to areas such as the Rift Valley, uh, uh, to areas such as Western Kenya, um, um, but then there was also increased kind of radicalization and recruitment activity during the same time that uh, in, 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 in Upper Eastern Kenya, so areas such as Marsabit and Isiolo became kind of uh, uh, new hotspots of, of, of these kind of extremist activities. Um, the network also became much more atomized, um, cells became smaller. Um, um, a lot of those who could transported themselves to Somalia where they received training. There was a new unit that was, uh, that was created by the late uh, 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 Ahmed Godani, the former leader of Al-Shabaab, called Jeshaiman, which is the unit that, is, that, is, uh, that, that staged itself in the Boni Forest, uh, straddling Tana River, Lamu counties, and southern Somalia. Um, so that by 20, say, um, 2016, we were facing a very different security challenge from this group. They were highly trained. Um, um, they had spent a lot of time in Somalia. Um, they, had, they had learned to, to, uh, to evade security agencies quite well. And I think that the... Um, The Ducid B2 attack uh, of 2019 was a kind of outcome uh, of these recent changes. You can see all these recent trends since 2015 coming together in that, in that Ducid D2 attack. Uh, um, one of which was the kind of recruitment of people from ethnic communities that are usually predominantly Christian. So then you saw, for example, that the leader of that cell um, uh, was, uh, I think, Ameru from, from, who was raised in Isiolo, whose mm. father is a military officer. Um, um, I think you saw that his, uh, what's called his wife or his girlfriend uh, was a Kisi, recent Muslim convert, a uh, graduate of, uh, of Muliro University. So you're seeing this kind of a new for lack of a better term, a new face of terrorism uh, emerging. But it had been, they had, it, it was a result of years and years of, of changes within, within the network. So COVID-19 um, 
becomes a global pandemic under this context mm. of, of terror and security in Kenya. Uh, COVID-19 becomes a problem for Kenya under the context of uh, an increasingly adaptive and resilient uh, terrorist network. Um, um, it becomes a problem at a time when the terrorist network in Kenya is looking more and more like, I would, I would say, more and more like us, me and you, Joe. It, it looks, mm. there are Luos in there, there are Kikuyus in there, there are Merus in there. So uh, it, it, it is more Kenyan than ever before. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think like the first physical um, impact of just the measures to curb the spread of COVID-19 the the shutting down of of borders for example and and, and the imposing the imposition of a curfew um, mm. um the the secession of movement from from certain counties was was an immediate kind of it had an immediate effect because then that immediately um it's not that they can't but it, it has really made it difficult for, for these actors to launch a serious attack under these new conditions of mm -hmm. increased surveillance. Um, and this is not only a Kenyan phenomenon. Across the world, uh, data from the Global Terrorism uh, Index shows that the number of attacks and have, 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 have drastically reduced uh, across the world during this time of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, at a, at, a, so at, a, at a physical level, um, um, extremist attacks have been curtailed. Extremist operations have been curtailed. Um, but then the, the, the downside, the other side of that is, is that there has been an uptick in, in online extremist content during the mm -hmm. same time. Right, right. And I mean, it's just I, I like I like how you've ended that the online uh, extremist content around around uh, this pandemic. But what are some yes. of the emerging narratives, you know, if I was to call them that, around I mean, this this social online uptick of of terrorism activity, and, and particularly without this 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 context where the contestation has, I mean, as you said, now the face terrorism now looks looks like you and I. It's it's now we are now seeing. Uh, uh, Christians joining the space. What are some of the emerging narratives around uh, these spaces that are that, that, that think something that's something to watch to watch for? Well, I think um, I, I think we, we we are still investigating. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I myself am part of uh, a number of a number of research projects that are doing exactly that, um, 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 which I'm not allowed to 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 talk about here. But 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 the kind of narratives. Um, New and not new in the sense that they, they, it's about framing. It's mm. really about framing. So, so again, before COVID-19, there was already a well-established um, extremist ecosystem, if you like, on online spaces in Kenya, mm. um, which is also one of the kind of trends we see becoming uh, pre predominant after the, after the 2014 you know, 2011, 2014 uh, security response in Kenya that we saw. Um, um, and, and the way in which these online narratives uh, uh, um, get constructed is not very different from how they were constructed at the time in which they had control over certain, certain mosques in Kenya. Right. Uh, and of course, um, um, the history of kind of the construction of these narratives, if you're looking at debates within the Muslim community itself, before you even talk about Muslim versus Christian, which is also a thing in itself, mm. is that for a, for, a, for a community that perceives of itself as a minority community in a, in a Christian dominated country, since the 1920s, there has been debates about what needs to be done to improve the conditions of that community. Um, um, and since the 1920s, again, to, to now, there, there has been two major 
uh, kind of uh, suggestions, if you like. There have been two major kind of suggestions and proposals. One is that we take our children to school, to secular school, to access secular education, so that they can gain the skills that uh, one needs to, oper to function in a modern kind of uh, state. Um, part of that response also suggests that um, Muslims should be able or should actually participate in the political process. Uh, especially now in the 1990s, you'd hear voices kind of supporting uh, this, this suggestion that Muslims should form political parties. So this the formation of the Islamic Party of Kenya, which was not actually registered, but that was part of that kind of thinking. Um, uh, um, the kind of formation of uh, Muslim community-based organizations, such as Muslim for Human Rights, Muhuri, for example, is based mm -hmm. in Mombasa, Coast Region, uh, 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 CIPK, uh, the Council of Islamic Preachers of Kenya, for example, NAMLEF. So you see, all these organizations are formed by individuals who believe that, that Muslim rights and interests can be advanced in Kenya by taking advantage of the political process. So that's one kind of suggestion. Um, the other suggestion, which becomes quite prominent from the mid 90s onwards, is that Muslims should not engage with the modern state altogether. Mm -hmm. that, that the modern state is irredeemably apostate, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's haram, it's, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, that, and that's the only solution um, uh, to address these Muslim concerns is to join international organizations such as Al-Qaeda that are hell-bent on upturning the international system status quo as we know it. Mm. Uh, uh, in this case, the f fighting of the West. Right. So you have very key voices in Kenya within the Muslim community you know, when we talk about these problems, uh, you know, when you're talking about whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Mali, whether it's Kenya, mm. the debate always starts within the Muslim community. Right. Before even the state gets to hear about it, or mm. the wider public gets to hear about the debate. Usually it starts within the Muslim community. And that there, there's a lot of polarization within the Muslim community itself regarding what needs to be done in this kind of sense of global powerlessness. Now, those narratives are what, those are the narratives that got injected into online spaces. Mm. Um, and therefore, what you find is that for the, extreme, for, for, for the extreme views or extremist narratives, there is a very uh, common division of the world into two, you know, into black and white. Uh, um, and basically everything that is happening in the world, including COVID-19, gets interpreted using that framework. Right. Okay? So then the narratives now started emerging. The narratives were, okay, this might be God's response to a simple world. Right? This is quite key. And this, you, it's interesting because you find this also being said by Christian groups as well. So it's not just Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, but then also the twist there is that um, Mombasa, I, I know for sure that in Mombasa, people would say uh, things like, this, this is the time when it was not really a big problem in Kenya, but it was, for example, in Italy, that, that, that you know, uh, 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 COVID-19 was a punishment from God uh, to, 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 to the Italian community uh, uh, due, to, due to, you know, their haram, haram uh, uh, behavior, uh, uh, I would mention, I, without any, giving any sort of evidence on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, and on WhatsApp chat groups, that, 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 that this was a punishment for Italy because of engaging in sexual orgies and things like that. Um, um, initially, when it was China, People would say this is a punishment to China for for their victimization of uh, of uh, of uh, Muslims in China, you know, Rohingya, the Rohingya stuff. 
so so there's a lot of commentary there of of trying to understand COVID COVID nineteen in a kind of religious sense, but also uh, in in a in a re religious sense that has also divided the world into black and white, into right and wrong, right, um, into us versus them. Mm. So that when uh, the government decided to lock down uh, Old Town and Isili, mm -hmm. I initially, I understood why they were doing that, but also initially thought it was quite irresponsible if they had paid attention to these narratives in, online in particular, they would have thought twice, or maybe they would have done the lockdown in a way that would not seem as if they were targeting the Muslim community, because it did seem as if they were targeting the Muslim community. And some, and, and some, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this because, because that's how people kind of perceived it uh, in these neighborhoods, and 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 sadly enough, uh, still do. So it just heightened again these narratives of victimization, um, um, that 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 not only government, the Kenyan government, the same government that people have perceived to have been victimized in the Muslim community, is using the COVID-19 excuse in this sense to further victimize the Muslim community, especially at a very important period as the Ramadan period. Right. So, I mean, so I, I like, thanks, thanks for that very elaborate uh, response. So, I mean, so, I mean, just, just take you to a point of a bit of rational conjecture. Uh, do, you, do you think in, in, your, in, your, in your view, whether COVID-19, uh, we create subjective conditions for, for terrorism to evolve further, or will, will, it, will, it, will, it, be, will it be lessened? How do you think? How do you think the conditions that COVID nineteen uh, digitization and the collapse of the global economy, a recession here, uh, will 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 change the landscape of of terror cells, Baruch terrorism within 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 East Africa? Well, I think I think we'll also have to know, which is very difficult, how COVID nineteen will evolve anyway. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, despite all these things. But but then again I think like what I was saying, what it has done is that it has really elicited debate and conversation mm. uh, and, and, and Al Shabaab in particular have been very active over the last few months, um, um, projecting and inserting an extremist view to understand, to interpret the COVID nineteen situation in a way that will draw support to their cause. Mm. Um, um, and, 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 and like I said, also, it's, it's really, for, for, for these groups, the COVID-19 situation has been read really as a sign um, that, that the, the status quo, the international status quo, uh, um, um, needs to collapse. Um, um, this is this is something that they've already been projecting and talking about and debating. Um, um, COVID nineteen presents to them an example of of, of why that should be the case. Mm. Now it is interesting that that question is not only being spoken by extremist groups such as Al Shabaab. That question um, um, is also coming from the critiques of the neoliberal world. Order. For, for, Absolutely. For example, yes. um, and that maybe the COVID nineteen will 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 then lead to a debate, hopefully, um, uh, of how to look at the market and the state, of how of how to look at uh, social services, in particular public health. Um, uh, these kind of question agenda in the extremist narratives is that the reestablishment of the caliphate, in, for example, um, which is seen as a cure-all solution to one, the um, sense of Muslim powerlessness in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West, but also of, uh, of, of, of behaviors that are not deemed as proper religious practice. Uh, that this this state that is wedded to 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 Islamic and Sharia law is the solution to even problems such as COVID nineteen. Mm. Um, um, it is a critique coming from that angle of the international status quo or the world order. Mm. But the point here is that that critique 
the, that critique of, 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 of the global world order, of the neoliberal world order, is also coming from other like spaces, in particular uh, uh, people from, you know, people with Marxist traditions and, 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 and such uh, schools of thought. Right. I mean, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I, I recognize that terrorism is, is really a, a Western import, so, so, so to speak. I mean, particularly to African lives. You know, your, your average Kenyan is more afraid of the mosquito uh, than, than he or she is of a bomb. So then, I mean, my question would be then, moving forward, I mean, moving forward, particularly in this time where there are a lot of debates, I mean, as you, as you rightly mentioned, debates around the neoliberal order, uh, debates around how, how we, we as, as a human society, both uh, in terms of uh, international cooperation, but even within uh, the, the, the African states that we are now debating their utility. Uh, how, how should we frame the, the idea of security uh, such that it's not pegged on a terrorism where it's, it's either protecting uh, the international world order or uh, terrorism as, as an avenue of corralling the natives, you know, I mean, where we have seen in the past where terrorism has been used to, to control the I mean, natives and as the African natives within, within our borders, curfews, you know, in northeastern, North, North, northeastern Kenya, they have a history of curfews, etc. So how then do we have a security debate that is centered around the protection of African lives and not the state or any other, and not the market either, mm. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're very right. The, for Kenya in particular, uh, the issue of, and we were discussing this before, before we went, we went live, but, but, but Mau Mau was deemed as a terrorist threat. Absolutely. At one point in the 1950s by, by the colonial state. And mm -hmm. actually for a pretty long period of time, even after independence, was, this was still kind of the narrative of the Mau Mau. Yes. Um, that's another debate there of how we choose mm. to remember the Mawa and Kenyan nation. Um, but, but terrorism, um, in this kind of context that, 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 we, are, that we are discussing, be, really becomes an issue in Kenya in 1998 with, uh, with, uh, with, 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 the, with the 1998 bomb blast that was targeting the, Kenyan, the, the US embassy here in Kenya. Um, you know, Maybe it has been forgotten, but a lot of activity happened after, after, after those attacks, led primarily by the US government, um, um, with the British government supporting uh, uh, as well. So that by the time we faced the second attack in 2002, uh, the terrorist police unit is set up immediately after that. And by 2005, um, we have a kind of what you, what you might call a nascent growing counter-terrorism space within, uh, in, in, in Kenya. Yeah? Um, um, there was the infamous, at, it, at the suppression of, of terrorism bill, I think 2005, which was not passed by parliament. But from then on, you would see uh, this kind of insertion of what was really an American security agenda into the security agendas of third world countries, Kenya being one of those identified frontline states because one, it had suffered the 1998 attack uh, and 2002, but also because of its geo, geo, geostrategic position in the Indian Ocean uh, in particular. The Indian Ocean also emerges in the post-1990 world as a, as a very important strategic geo, geo, geo space. Um, so Kenya is kind of centered within this, within this uh, war. In fact, it was called the War on Terror. This, this was actually the official name of, 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 of the program. Um, and, and, and one way in which that program was implemented, of course, was a lot of money being given to, to the Kenyan state, the Kenyan government, to build uh, its, its security agencies, to train them, to be able to combat terrorism. Um, um, I know that there was training that was happening in places such as Manda, Manda Island, in Lamu. In Lamu. This is long before al -Shabaab. Uh, there was already this architecture, the point I'm trying, I'm trying to, 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 to make here. Um, the thing about terrorism as an activity is that it does 
exactly that. It terrorizes. Um, and, 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 and COVID-19, um, I, I'm not, I don't know about now uh, with, with, uh, with, the, with the question around quarantine fatigue, but COVID-19 operated quite similarly. You know, uh, it's a very small thing that, uh, um, um, and, and then you're, you're scared of something you can't see, right? So terrorism operates like that. Um, it may not have killed many people compared to traffic accidents or mosquito bites. Uh, As, as you mentioned, no one wants to die like that. And that's the power of terrorism. Terrorism is violence by propaganda, which is why, in a sense, um, it, it, it attracts a lot of attention to itself, even in terms of how governments choose to respond to it. It's very disruptive, as you say, to the market, to, to the idea of the state as a, as a monopoly of violence. It's destructive to all those ideas, which is why there's been a lot, of, a lot of attention to this kind of activity. But also, most importantly, it really strikes at the heart of the neoliberal world order as well, um, mm. as it has been championed by, by the West. So all these things combine to formulate counterterrorism policies that have ended up, unfortunately, um, hurting Many, many Kenyans, as you mentioned, in northeastern Kenya on the coast. You know, 800 people were arrested night after, after, the, after the 1998 bomb blast, for example, in the neighborhoods of Majengo and Old Town in Mombasa. And this was just repeated over the years, over the years, such, such that in, even in 2007, um, um, my friend Alamin Kimathi was at the forefront of, 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 of producing reports of Kenyans who had been renditioned. Uh, uh, to foreign countries and ended up at, Guantan uh, uh, at the Gu Guantanamo Bay in, in, uh, in, in you know, an, an American holding facility without any trial. Um, uh, so the Kenyan government has been quite complicit in this uh, international um, uh, uh, counterterrorism uh, effort. Mm. The critique of that then has been um, is that the power that has been given to African governments, Kenya being one, by, by this counter-terrorism counter architecture, is that they were not only able, I mean, if, if at all they were, to fight terrorists, but um, they became much more authoritarian. Um, it was the end of a period in the early 90s. So there, there has been a, a critique of, of this global counterterrorism uh, strategy um, um, that, was, that, that, that emerged in, for Kenya in particular in, in the late 90s and, and throughout the first half of the, of the 2000s. This is years before the emergence of Al-Shabaab in Somalia in 2006. Um, that it led to heavy-handed responses uh, that targeted and victimized the Muslim communities of Kenya. Um, there was actually a narrative there that was quite, that was quite uh, dominant, I think it, it quite still is in certain policy circles, uh, that the problem it, for, for Kenyan elites initially was not seen as a Kenyan problem, uh, that, 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 that Kenya was just a victim in a, in a global war pitting the West and, uh, and, 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 and the Middle East. Um, of course, these, these narratives were quite faulty, given the sense that many, many Kenyans, young Kenyans from predominantly Christian communities were getting, were getting recruited by, by extremist groups and, and were getting recruited um, with narratives that, that communicated the Kenyan Muslim experience and only related it with the global victimization, Muslim victimization narrative. So that a lot that was happening within Kenya uh, that affected the Muslim community um, was getting um, um, 
narratives of getting constructed out of those local experiences um, um, that then supported and, and legitimized extremist activities. Um, so that was one of the critique of the global counterterrorism strategy is that first and foremost, it has enabled governments in the third world to, to, to avoid their own responsibility in creating this problem within their own countries. That, that was number one. Number two is that because the security architecture of, of, of many third world states had been, had been, um, um, had been rejuvenated by the global war on terror. Remember, um, as I was saying, we had moved away from the early 90s and late 80s when Western governments um, um, were willing, and they did, uh, uh, ask many uh, uh, third world governments, African governments, to democratize, to open the market. Um, um, otherwise, they'll be denied uh, global funding. By the, by the 2000s, you're seeing a very different relationship that's being driven by this kind of fear of terrorism, where um, human rights violations would go um, um, without being critiqued by Western governments, because it was seen as a way in which these frontline states were protecting uh, the long-term interests of, of, of countries such as, such, as, such as the United States and, and the United Kingdom. And so a lot of human rights violations were actually committed in, in the name of fighting terror. And, 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 and there was not a lot of powerful, powerful critique that was coming from, from Western governments because they are actually were behind uh, uh, funding uh, these, these, these sort of activities. Um, but also the other critique were, is, 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 what you allude to, is what you allude to, which is what is security anyway? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and not only are people say in, in the neighborhoods that have been affected so much by this problem, and the regions that have been affected so much by this problem, Northeastern Kenya, the Kenyan coast, um, I've been conducting studies, or I've been part of teams that have conducted studies on the Kenyan coast around crime, security, and politics. And every time we ask people in surveys what they consider to be the greatest security threat to them, Number one is always regular crime. Um, um, Mombasa, they say, Mimi na ugo pakipanga, si ugo pikrunedi. You know what I mean? So, mm. so um, um, and number two would be unemployment. Mm. They see that as a security risk. Right. Because it's unemployment that then leads to this kind of this sort of behavior, uh, this sort of behaviors. In fact, terrorism would feature at number four or number five of what they consider to be the greatest security threat facing a place like Mombasa. Um, yet in policy circles, in international forums, and in conferences that we have here in Nairobi, we, you would think that terrorism is the most important uh, uh, aspect of security to be paid attention to. Yet, in the eyes of people living in these communities, that's not really, it doesn't really feature as what they consider to be the highest security risk. Um, which then invites questions around, say, human security, for example. Um, um, which I think now is related to the, the Human Development Index, HDI, that's that was true. developed um, 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 under, under the UN system. Um, the idea that if you provide jobs, if you create jobs, um, um, if you um, provide, provide uh, uh, safe access to water, um, uh, to food, um, um, if people live in a clean environment, that these are far much important uh, questions of security indeed. That, that need to be looked at. But then when you ask those questions, you are also asking very important questions around what is the role of the state, especially in a neoliberal context where the state has really rolled itself back and has allowed uh, uh, the market to take charge of very important fundamental aspects uh, of, of, of humanity, such as health, education, 
uh, uh, recreational facilities and, 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 and things of that nature. So then my last question then, I mean, because I mean, moving post COVID, there are very many conversations happening here in Kenya, but even uh, globally around, I mean, where we are witnessing the collapse of the neoliberal order as it is, because I mean, clearly, clearly the market can't, can't deal with this pandemic. So, I mean, a lot of debates coming, coming across from different quarters around saying that there needs to be a space for the collective, uh, collective government to intervene into, into matters of human development. So then what, what kind of framing would, would we need for a security, a security debate, moving it away from uh, the, I think the now, the, the now defunct idea of terrorism, uh, the, the idea of you know, Al-Shabaab, Al I'm not saying they're not important, but what framing and what language and words do we need to really center the conversation around uh, human security? Um, you would have to also change your notion of the state to be able to have that kind of So, you, I mean, look at how the Kenyan government, but also many governments, chose to respond to COVID in the first place. They, mm. they, they responded to it as if it was a security threat. Mm. Um, 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 uh, unleashing security forces on people who are trying to get home. Um, actually ending up killing people to protect them from COVID-19. Um, how ironic uh, 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 that, that, that was. Um, this, this, this language, I mean, you know, the, the Kenyan state is a post-colonial state. So, so it's, the original scene here is that, is that it's, it's quite alien as an institution. And, and, and it really exists from, from, from its foundations to, to, to protect the capitalist class um, and therefore to protect the market um, and put everyone in their place in a way that they can produce labor for this kind of capitalist system. That's why the state is there. And that's, and that's the conception of the state. Um, um, which is why COVID-19, which paradoxically in a country like Kenya is brought in by the middle and upper classes, and uh, the, the traveling elite. Um, people living in the slums of Nairobi and Mombasa are seen to be a, a bigger threat of spreading COVID-19. Um, um, yet it's not them who brought the disease, if you see what I mean. So, Absolutely. So, so now it's like lock them down, let them not move so that we protect, we protect uh, as, as David D calls them, upper deck people. Absolutely. Right? Um, um, so to have a debate that's, that, that is socialist, um, that begins to call in the, the you know, what they call the bringing, bring, bringing the state back into social services, to the social sectors, um, um, to create an enabling environment for all sorts of businesses and, 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 and economies, um, um, to protect people physically, but also from ailments and diseases. That question, um, um, which of course was at the heart of the, of, of the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s, um, is a question about the state. And you're quite right, it needs to come back in, but it will depend, again, I think, and this is a question that, this is something that's been discussed also in the West, um, it will depend how long will this COVID-19 crisis uh, last to begin to have that question. Right. Yeah. As well. Otherwise, people are just going to move back to, 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 to their normal lives um, and then the whole thing will just be forgotten. Mm. Okay. I think, I, think I, I want us to end with that very powerful note around, you know, we need to ask ourselves what 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 we need the state for and what security is. Thank you so much for 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 joining us here, at the elephant. Thank you. Okay, be well, be well, and be safe. Thank you. Okay.